Hi everyone. Um, I am Rebecca Bernhardt with Texas Physicians for Social Responsibility. Um, thank you for joining us this evening uh, to talk about um, how climate change impacts cancer. Um, our speaker is Dr. Lakshmi Balasubramanian, um, MD, MS, uh, who has a specialization in both medical oncology um, and climate medicine. Um, Dr. Balasubramanian, would you like to get us started? Thanks, Becky, for the introduction. Um, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be present today and sharing the evening with you. Um, just as a background, I'm a clinician. I'm a medical oncologist and hematologist. And um, my interest in climate change um, probably solidified the year of 2021. Um, I'm speaking from the platform. Yeah, I'm on the board for Texas uh, PSR, and I'm speaking through them, and I appreciate uh, Texas um, uh, UT um, Houston School of Public Health for giving us the opportunity for CMEs as well. But next, I have no particular disclosures. Um, today, I just wanted to go through a few learning objectives and uh, and make it a little bit more interactive using real life scenarios to understand this fairly vast and complicated topic. Um, I, I do tend to find that when I delve into it, it is um, it feels like a weight on our shoulders. So I try to make it more um, relatable to everyday events. Um, so the first objective is to discuss the interplay between climate change and cancer. Um, next is to understand how climate change affects our patients. Uh, with cancer using case studies as examples, more in terms of what a generalist needs to know. The next would be to discuss cancer prevention and recurrence, um, something called co-benefits, uh, behavioral modifications um, to adapt to climate change leads to some benefits for our health, and those are termed as co-benefits. Understanding the adverse cancer outcomes resulting from health inequity and disparate exposures. And finally, to discuss some solutions. Um, and as part of that, providing some successful adaptation strategies, as well as um, some decarbonization concepts that are evolving, such as life cycle analysis and quality improvement and sustainability projects. Next. I split this up into a few separate topics. The first one was uh, just the basic climate change, global weirding, and how this uh, turns out to be a threat multiplier. Uh, then the climate change and oncology interplay, followed by case studies, co-benefits, health equity, and finally the opportunity for us as healthcare practitioners. Next. Um, so this is just a reflection of how this came about in my life. And some and many of us can relate to things like this that happened to us. 2021 was the year of COVID. Um, and along with that, in Texas, we had winter storm Ori, which was devastating, but also crippling to our uh, healthcare um, system. And uh, there is a news article there that puts the final estimate of winter storm death toll at 246. And one of those was one of my patients. Uh, she did not make it to clinic after the winter storm and we had to send the medical examiner and uh, she, she was found demised at home. So that was the start of my journey um, to understand this better. Um, the same year, you know, two months later, there was a massive hailstorm. Uh, literally, our staff sat in clinic and watched their cars getting um, dented. Um, and uh, that year, I also had some family needs. Um, my dad passed away during COVID, so I was on my way to India in July and uh, literally was stuck in Dallas, Washington, Dallas Airport on the runway for 10 hours because Newark Airport was flooded. And that again was one of those severe weather events that struck. So I eventually did make it to India and you see my mom in the plane, we're on our way, but to get her here was a big problem. The next slide, please. This was uh, Chennai um, just before uh, we left. Uh, so the two days preceding, there were massive floods. Uh, two of those photographs are something that I took from uh, while, from the car while we were driving. 
and a couple of those are stock photographs, but this is how evacuation happened. You know, children and families walking with a bag of their belongings, the elderly being carried out, and this was a stark reminder of how um, folks who contribute little are affected quite significantly as a result of these severe weather events. Um, and this led to my journey in understanding what was happening and what we could do about it. Next. Um, and this probably describes what goes on well, you know, as we think about climate change and global warming, uh, somehow warming doesn't seem to go well with floods and bugs and, um, and uh, severe winter storms. Um, but the New York Times reporter in way back in 2007, Thomas Friedman, um, wrote this article and wrote that global warming doesn't really capture what's likely to happen. I prefer the term global weirding coined by Hunter Lovins, co-founder of the Rocky Mountain Institute, because the rise in average global temperature is going to lead to all sorts of crazy things from hotter heat spells and droughts in some places to colder cold spells and more violent storms, more intense flooding, forest fires, and species loss in other places. And, and here we are in 2023, reflecting on this piece that was written uh, way back in 2007. Next slide. Um, wanted to set the background of the bodies of evidence. In medicine, we practice evidence-based um, practice or evidence-based medicine. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, which is a UN-based um, uh, um, report, uh, is a fairly voluminous report of multiple um, uh, segments uh, that gives us the, a lot of data and, and a pathway for how we can adapt for global change. Um, the fourth national assessment is what I have there, but the fifth national climate assessment was just released and it's definitely worth looking at. Chapter 15 with um, uh, um, FCA 5, NCA 5 actually addresses climate and health. Uh, then we have the Lancet Countdown. Um, every year there is an update with the Lancet Countdown with the report on where we stand with our climate health. And often we hear about the Paris Climate Agreement, but that was COP21 that was held in uh, Paris that actually led to this international uh, uh, signing um, or signatory agreement to decarbonize, to regulate our temperatures. Next. So this was just released. Um, this, is, uh, it, this highlights our regions. Uh, so each of us can look to see which region we belong to. In Texas, we belong to the Southern Great Plains. Um, and for this region, we're anticipated to have higher annual temperatures, warmer nights, um, higher annual precipitation, heavier precipitation, and sea level rise. Um, it does also um, give us uh, some information in how limiting future warming can have near-term benefits and opportunities, particularly for our health. Um, NCA 5 is our um, national U.S. national report that is congressionally mandated. Um, it started in 1990, originally set up during President Reagan's time and has since then continued every five years um, and gives us a report of regions, what to anticipate and areas of opportunity. Next. Um, this just shows the 10, the, the ten regions, and um, it's split up based on our climate risks um, into these separate regions. Next. Um, here is something that is quite striking. Um, NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, publishes our billion-dollar weather events and climate disasters. Climate disasters are expensive. Um, 2017 was thus far the most expensive with all of those hurricanes. Um, this year, 2023, Texas leads the way. We have had uh, three hailstorms, um, severe weather, um, it, it, you know, the severe heat waves. Um, not only do the heat waves lead to um, health issues, but also agriculture, food insecurity, um, inability to exercise, 
Um, but this just highlights the billion dollar weather events. And it's it's currently estimated that we have a billion dollar weather event almost every three weeks in the United States. Next. And this shows Florida leading the way with California, Texas, Louisiana, North Carolina, not far behind, but no place is exempt from the billion dollar disasters. Next. Um, leading this and tying this into cancer, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, has um, defined the continuum of cancer care from etiology going on to prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship. Climate change affects every one of these. Um, and we'll look at a little bit um, of data in each one of these that's relevant to our daily life. Next. In 2020, this is a UCSF group, um, Professor Hyatt and um, Bailair, they, they did a um, kind of a literature analysis of uh, information available uh, between climate change and cancer and beautifully put together this uh, interplay um, diagram. Um, you can see there are um, the etiology related things, the primary site of cancer, lung, skin, gastrointestinal, others that are influencing factors. Um, climate change can affect the cancer related effects and, and in turn cause the cancer. Uh, you also have drought and wildfire, heat, sea level rise, all of the other um, climatic conditions that, that result in its own um, downstream effects such as air pollution, particulate matter, um, human behavioral changes such as uh, decrease in activity, the need to use sun protection, food insecurity, water pollution. We all know our, um, our population of patients with cancer on treatment are highly susceptible to infections, uh, both opportunistic and natural. And um, however, the largest influence of climate change on cancer was its effect on the health systems and the healthcare access itself. So the health systems, the way health um, healthcare is delivered, transportation, uh, supply chain interruptions, accessibility to healthcare, the quality of healthcare, um, the inequities that result from uh, climate migration and displacement, public health policies, um, so the largest impact that was noted and is anticipated to continue is the, uh, is the impact on the health systems and the healthcare access. Next. Um, so a little bit more on particulate matter. Um, the um, International Agency for Research on Cancer um, did designate a PM 2.5. So this is fine particulate matter. And a lot of this comes from combustion particles um, and organic compounds as a carcinogen. Um, typically, this uh, causes lung cancer. But in terms of the size of the particles, uh, what you see as the long string is uh, human hair. So that's the diameter of human hair. The small blue beads are dust and pollen, so larger particulate matter. And the red beads on top of that circled blue bead, which is then magnified as PM 2.5. So very fine particulate matter, less than 2.5 microns in diameter, um, has an impact on our health. Next. How does air pollution um, and lung cancer uh, play a role together? Air pollution is the second leading cause of lung cancer. Um, PM 2.5 was found to be the main factor affecting the occurrence of lung cancer. There was a Chinese study that looked at almost 150,000 patients and um, PM 2.5 along with tobacco use was a compounding factor, but PM 2.5 by, by itself was a primary factor in occurrence of lung cancer. Uh, we talked about uh, IARC designating 2.5 as a carcinogen. And it's estimated that um, that about that, that there are about 30% increase in 
um, lung cancer deaths despite a decrease in smoking. And some of that may be related, it's, it's postulated to be related to air pollution increase. Next. How does climate change affect particulate matter? Um, there's increasing emissions from fossil fuel fire power plants. Um, there's a global demand for electricity and cooling. The emissions result in particulate matter that in turn are, are an etiology for lung cancer. But the heat and drought also increases wildfire and the wildfire smoke um, has particulate matter that also is a contributor. Next. Lung cancer is the leading type of cancer death in the United States. Next. So we wanted to lead this into a case study. Um, uh, you know, many of us see such patients in our clinic. A 58-year-old female, Judy, never smoker, no history of secondhand smoke exposure, presents with hemoptysis a fiber optic bronchoscopy and a, and a needle um, aspiration uh, diagnoses her with adenocarcinoma, non-small cell lung cancer with an EGFR mutation. Uh, several other studies are performed and she's diagnosed with a locally advanced lung cancer with lymph node metastasis, but nothing that is widespread that would make her incurable. Next. So this was a Sentinel presentation last year at the European Society of Medical Oncology. Um, this was a plenary session presentation. And um, they, uh, Dr. Swanton's group actually um, presented their identification of a pathway um, where air pollution leads to lung cancer in non-smokers. And um, next slide. It was um, noted that many of us, more than 50% of normal lung, have driver mutations, KRAS and the EGFR, but pollution induces inflammation and interleukin production, and then differentiation of uh, cells that are at risk to result in tumor formation. And this was um, presented as a, pos a possible way of, or a mechanism of cancer etiology in non-smokers, but also gives us an opportunity to see if there is a role for prevention in high-risk population. Work is ongoing here. Next. There are many ways to quantify the burden of cancer, um, and these are just highlights. I don't want to go too far into the details, but um, there is a there is there is a study or, or data available called the Global Burden of Disease Study and happens every few years, uh, re-evaluated. This is from 2019. Um, a sin significant number, 15% of disease burden um, is attributed to PM2.5. Deaths from PM2.5 or the small particulate matter is increasing. Um, and air pollution related lung cancer mortality has increased from 2015 to 2017. So one of the ways they look at is the burden of disease globally. Next. Another way of looking at the impact of cancer on human life is something called disability adjusted life years. So our morbidity, how does it affect our livelihood or daily life while we are living with the cancer? And this particular graph is very busy, but the areas I highlighted show that air pollution results almost entirely in men and women to lung cancers, and lung cancer is a significant contributor to what we call DALIs. Next. And for the first time, uh, the global um, Burden study also looked at the economic cost of cancer, and it um, estimated the international dollars um, to uh, cost of cancer care between 2020 and 2050 to be 25 trillion dollars, with U.S. and China facing the largest economic burden, and United States more so because the cost of treatment 
in high income countries is higher than in lower income countries. So it poses a fairly significant economic burden. And these are possibly modifiable risk factors where we can make a difference to decompress some of the burden our healthcare system is facing. Next slide. So just continuing Judy's story, she starts treatment, she gets uh, systemic therapy um, per NCCN guidelines. She subsequently gets radiation therapy and the intention is try to shrink her cancer and then take her to surgery if she does well with the initial treatment. While she's undergoing induction radiation, she's forced to evacuate uh, for a category four hurricane. She moves to her sister's place. She establishes care with new providers. As a result of her temporary climate migration status, there was a delay of about four weeks before she can resume her interrupted radiation therapy. So what does this mean for her? There are many people who are displaced as a result of hurricanes and wildfires, et cetera. And what does this mean for them? Next. There is data, extreme weather events adversely affects cancer outcomes. Um, we know from historical data that if radiation treatment is interrupted and the time to treatment is prolonged, survival can be adversely affected, meaning cure rates can be lower. Um, and Nogera et al, um, Nogera Leticia is from ACS, um, did a wonderful study looking at hurricane disaster declared during radiation therapy. And the study demonstrated that there was associated worse overall survival in patients who were treated with locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer. So stage three lung cancer, which our patient Judy has. And the longer the declaration for the hurricane, the worse the overall survival. So if treatment was interrupted for Two weeks, it was worse than a one week interruption. And this poses an opportunity for us for disaster resilience and mitigation planning, because there is no correction for radio radiation delays. Um, working on some um, resilience strategies, such as identifying these patients, transferring their treatment in anticipation of these events, um, working with insurance to eliminate out-of-network insurance charges. There are many areas of opportunity for us to work towards improvement in patient care. Next. So continuing Judy's story, she completes her radiation. Post-induction, she's doing great. She has no apparent progression. So she's able to go on to lung resection surgery. However, unfortunately, two months after surgery, she's at her sister's place and air quality is affected from severe wildfire smoke in her zip code. Uh, she was not in an evacuation zone, but wildfire smoke um, is inundating the area where she lives. What does this mean for her? Next. Um, just this year, um, given all the wildfires that we have had, um, this particular study looked at association of wildfire exposure while recovering from lung cancer surgery. The objective was to assess the association between the wildfire exposure and the long-term survival amongst these patients with lung cancer. And the conclusion of it was that exposure to wildfire increased the risk of death in patients recovering from non-small cell lung cancer surgery across the United States. And steps to, to, can be taken to reduce the risk, such as wearing an N95 mask. You know, there are many things we can do to interrupt. But the bottom line for Judy, she completes her treatment with curative intent. We all know treatment is fairly difficult to go through. But for reasons beyond her control, such as her severe weather-related impacts, she may have a possible higher recurrence risk and mortality due to her hurricane evacuation and her wildfire exposure. So combating climate change is the most important tool we have to curb their negative effects on our patient with cancer. Next slide. It's another case study. 
Harry is 45. He's from Puerto Rico. Um, the setting is in 2017. None of these are real life stories, by the way. He has a cancer called multiple myeloma. It's a, it's a blood related cancer, um, which affects the bone and bone marrow. Um, he received his initial treatment. He's on pill forms of therapy, lenalidomide and dexamethasone. One is an expensive restrictive drug. The other has, both of them have side effects. He also has some mobility limitations. He needs some DME assistance with a wheelchair because of his spine involvement from myeloma. And as a result of his steroids required to treat his myeloma, he also has insulin requiring diabetes. He's on peritoneal dialysis because his kidneys failed initially when he was diagnosed with myeloma. Um, and in September 2017, Hurricane Maria makes landfall in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico loses electricity, Harry's house does too. And besides his regular day-to-day -day needs that a 45-year-old needs, he's also unable to store his insulin. He's unable to continue his peritoneal dialysis without electricity. And due to his mobility limitations, he's evacuated by a DMAT team to Florida. His medications are lost in the process. He eventually, um, typically you those work with DMAT teams, um, if they're evacuated by DMAT team, they do try to get them back home by DMAT. Um, but he makes it back to Puerto Rico in December of 2017, but he unfortunately does not survive the process. In December, he passes away. Next slide. This is um, this is a way to assess vulnerability. Um, this is these intersections have been used in many ways. Vulnerability is um, an intersection of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So the numerator exposure and sensitivity if they're high. So Harry's exposure in Puerto Rico to a hurricane was high. He had many medical issues, so his sensitivity to disruptions was also high. And because of his vulnerabilities or his health conditions, his adaptive capacity was low. So his vulnerability was extremely high. Next. So Maria was um, one that highlighted um, numerous downstream effects. Um, there were a there were a couple of uh, studies done after Hurricane Maria that looked at assessing the actual mortality because it seemed like the people who were reported as um, as um, dead uh, was far lower than what may actually be going on. And there were a couple of studies and each of them had different numbers. You, this particular study I showed has about 4,600 deaths. There was another study right after this from George Washington that was about 3,000 deaths or so. But in any event, it appeared that the mortality reported is um, usually significantly undercounting the actual mortality. And even the surveys may actually have an underestimation because of survivor bias. Um, in addition, even early into 2018, so the hurricane happened in 2017, um, Puerto Rico remained without electricity and it was a humanitarian crisis. And those in, uh, in medical, your clinical practice, and this particularly was heavily felt in our oncology clinics, Puerto Rico had Baxter, um, which produced IV fluids. So there was a dire immediate shortage of small volume saline bags. Hydration, mixing or chemotherapy, administration of treatment uh, was significantly impacted. We had to ration saline after um, Hurricane Maria, and this was nationwide, where FDA and other regulatory agencies had to assist to try to get some fluids in. In addition, there are documented a significant mental health impacts as well. Next. And one third of this extra deaths from Maria were attributed to delayed or interrupted healthcare. So this goes back to Professor Hyatt's evaluation where the biggest impact is, uh, or one of the biggest impacts we see is in the disruption of the healthcare um, delivery infrastructure, communication systems, medication, medical record loss, um, and even screening is affected. 
Drawing parallels from COVID-19, um, COVID-19 highlighted the excess deaths that we will see from diseases that are very amenable to screening, such as breast and colon cancer. The disruption from COVID was estimated to result in about 10,000 excess, excess deaths. And we're seeing similar parallels happening with severe weather events where people are delaying their screening or unable to do their screening um, for a variety of reasons because um, of migration or financial reasons. Next. So the next element um, wanted to get into, um, next slide, in the cancer care continuum is the co-benefits or prevention. Um, from an oncology standpoint, healthy diet and physical activity reduces cancer risk as well as recurrence. So um, interventions that are performed for the foundation of a more sustainable healthcare system inadvertently has a beneficial co-benefit where there is more social equity, cleaner air, physical activity, healthier diet that naturally are cancer preventive and recurrence reductive. Next. Um, this leads, uh, the next topic is health equity. Um, this, um, this process called redlining um, actually is one that has um, now led to lots of studies that reveal the risk of pollution, PM2.5 and lung cancer. There was a homeowner's loan act from years ago um, this was uh, called redlining, and it was it was a um, it was a residential mapping system that was done to prevent people of color or of indigenous community from um, building integrating or integrating into the community, and that actually continues on to modern day impacts. The three maps we see the. One with the red, yellow, and green is a neighborhood um, uh, desirable living area. The middle is nitrous oxide pollution. And the last one is non-white population. And we'll see the red areas that are undesirable are also high in pollution. And the darker spaces, blue and teal, overlap with non-white population. Next. Um, a similar study, and this was particular um, or specific to carcinogens and lung cancer just from wards in Washington, D.C., and you can see the same overlap, red, orange overlapping with the blues, purples, and teals, where there is an increase in lung cancer risk for the vulnerable population. Next. So what are our areas of opportunity? And I'm going to um, give a little bit more specifics from the cancer standpoint, you know, from our clinical practice. Um, and each, you know, uh, person can think about it and how it would apply to their own areas of practice, um, et cetera. So there are pillars of opportunity are one leadership. Uh, we can educate, we can learn, we can train, we can research, we can advocate, we can be involved in policy. All of those things that, you know, as um, medical professionals, we have an opportunity to engage in. The second is dealing with the right now or primary protection. Um, the climate change severe weather events are here and we need to make our current systems resilient. And the third is for future decarbonization. How do we reduce our future impacts by, by um, integrating changes of reducing our ways of practice now? Next. So some examples in medical education. Um, Harvard Medical School um, Committee voted um, this year to embed uh, climate change into their MD curriculum. 
There are fellowship programs that are focused on climate change and health. Um, the two are at Harvard Bethesda Deaconess and University of Colorado, but this is growing. This There is momentum and there's an increased interest and there are many opportunities for education um, and continuing medica medical education in the field where we can learn about something that we were not taught in medical school or in our health professional school. Next. Research. Um, this is an area that fascinates me. Um, how can we learn how to make an impact? We have to demonstrate tangible benefits or risks and more importantly, financial benefits uh, that eventually will move the administrative uh, trend towards becoming more sustainable in our practice. Um, so the one of the ways of doing this is called life cycle assessment. So we're looking at a product or a process from cradle, so from the start, from the raw materials to the grave, um, from where it's incinerated, but now the newer concept is circular. So cradle to cradle analysis is the newer concept. So the first um, way of doing that is dumpster diving or, or um, red bagging. So waste audit, and this was a hysterectomy study. So in oncology, we have gynecologic cancers that require a hysterectomy. And this looked at hysterectomy versus laparoscopic hysterectomy and did a life cycle analysis. The next is actually ongoing. Katie Lichter's team at UCSF is looking at radiation therapy delivery in the common cancers using shorter, more intense course, what we call hyperfractionation, versus standard lower, longer courses of radiation to see if one is better than another. Uh, and literally you're doing carbon accounting and seeing how it matches up. Uh, sometimes the results are surprising because um, a lot of these um, outcomes depend on the energy source used. You know, do we incinerate? Do we use coal for energy? Or does the system have renewable energy where the impact is lesser? Um, and the last one is laryngoscope. So it can be a surgery. It can be a procedure. It can be a device. It can be a drug. Drug companies are also very much involved in sustainability planning now, and they are interested in partnering in um, in in um, or they are interested in partnerships where we can all work together to reduce the impact. So it it, it affects each of our bottom line and how we practice. Next, Europe. Um, the UK particularly is far ahead. Um, they have something, a, a concept called sustainability quality improvement. We all now practice value-based care. Uh, so we're looking at outcomes for patients and populations, and we're looking at the social and financial impacts. But the triple bottom line is where we include the environmental impact as well. So they, they conducted something called green team competition. It was five different teams, five different um, um, kind of uh, uh, projects that they undertook over like a 10 week period, I think. The one that I highlighted here is in palliative care for oncology where they're using light therapy, um, photobiomodulation to reduce the mouth sores from chemotherapy and radiation from head and neck cancer. And they demonstrated that besides reducing symptoms, medications, and hospital admissions, it cut costs significantly by thousands of pounds and carbon emissions um, averaging miles and miles driven in an average car. Um, and this was for about 180 patients or so. Next. These were um, different ways of how, or five different projects that they can they conducted, and we can see every one of these, you know, can apply to oncology. Um, the last two are directly from oncology. It's identifying patients at high risk of fracture in an acute oncology ward. Uh, the last one is the oral mucositis we talked about. Then there are surgical procedures, crash carts, uh, nitrous oxide leakage use um, for the OR. 
Um, and every one of these, they were able to do this in a fun manner um, where they use the um, green teams as a um, competing against each other to accomplish this. Next. Um, we can also share knowledge, like the LCA database is now a living repository, it is free. Um, these are things that are highlighted in oncology. Nivolumab is one of our immunotherapy drugs, you have surgical gloves, nitrile and latex, hand gels. So there's, and this is a large repository and growing. So sharing our knowledge is another way where we can um, lead in this space. Next. Policy, um, um, ESMO has a task force, our Radiation Oncology Society um, has issued a climate change policy, AMA has a climate change policy, and the Royal College of Physicians in UK has incorporated sustainability as one of their quality domains. So it's in addition to the six basic qualities, including patient safety, sustainability is now one of their quality domains. Next. Advocacy, there are many modes. We don't have to recreate this, but um, medical society consortium, you know, oncology groups or whatever group others belong to can be part of advocacy resources. Next. Um, and then adaptation planning. This is one of the more uh, unique, um, individually tailored uh, processes. So you actually assess the, the health risks and the vulnerability risks for your population and then perform an adaptation planning for current day impacts or threats. And the all of these, these four that I highlighted are from CDC. The BRACE network is one that is used fairly frequently. Um, it is available on the CDC website in many counties and institutes use this. Um, there are toolkits. I highlighted the Southern Great Plains. So say, for example, we take an oncology, you know, one of my patients with head and neck cancer. Um, they can't eat. They can't drink. We have 105 degrees outside in Texas. They're on a platinum based therapy and their kidneys at risk for failing. So identifying these individuals educating them to hydrate, monitoring them more closely, bringing them in for fluids if we need to more proactively to prevent complications is a simple way of individualized risk adapted adaptation planning. Next. Um, and this is an example of how a cancer center can harness um, our Inflation Reduction Act money to build a climate resilient clinic. Um, the White House HHS has a voluntary uh, pledge. Um, you can see many institutes have signed. Um, CMS has issued a categorical waiver where we can have a micro grid, so alternative energy grid instead of a generator um, to have an additional source of energy if there is a failure. Um, the um, Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, OCHI, has a quick finder. It's actually a QR code you can use to leverage um, money that we can get as a discount or a credit, even for nonprofit organizations that don't file taxes, a tax credit can be obtained or money can be obtained for um, using uh, the IRA uh, funds to decarbonize. So setting up a microgrid, for example, for a cancer clinic. We're in Texas, um, we need to operate radiation. We just demonstrated interrupting radiation or chemotherapy can be detrimental to our patients. We are at risk for electricity failure. So having a microgrid, next slide please, can successfully um, utilize energy storage and work in conjunction with the existing electric system, the grid system, or independently if that fails, um, and can be cost saving. So Kaiser has done that for all their facilities, including oncology. And Gunderson Health is one of the leaders in this space where they not only transition to renewable energy with 
biogas, biomass, geothermal, microgrids, um, solar, et cetera, they actually make money off of it. Um, so their transition, you know, their, their return on their investment that they put in is actually generating money and their clinics are independent of many of these um, environmental failures. Um, and this is, you know, I think for the future, fairly important for us to adapt to the changing climate. Next. Um, this is a case study, uh, very quick, uh, you know, Katrina was a failure um, in terms of uh, resiliency of our healthcare system. A lot failed. There are so much is written about that, but also lessons learned. And learning from that and also its past experiences, Harris County, next slide. Um, this is Houston. So Harris County learned from their own previous floods and indirectly from Katrina and uh, Hurricane Sandy, which uh, really affected um, Manhattan, Bellevue, those hospitals in New York. Um, they implemented regular training exercises for their disaster planning. So incident action plans were in place in the event this happened again. And there came 2017 Hurricane Harvey. Um, and they had had put in place some infrastructure improvements, advanced planning, dedicated hospital staff to deal with this, a collaborative effort that helped. It, there were issues, but still was a way better than what Hurricane Katrina was. So this is a learning lesson that learning to adapt actually does help our patients survive these events that are coming our way better. Next. And then final um, thought, this is Ed Maybach's team from um, George Mason, one of the leaders in climate communication. This is a challenge we have faced as healthcare providers. We learned COVID backfired on us and we've lost, lost trust with our patients. Um, but um, through this, then this is 2022, um, trusted messengers, it, regardless, all registered voters, Physicians, nurses, providers are one of the highly trusted messengers. And um, Ed's two guiding heuristics are keep your messages simple, simple, clear, repeated often messages by a variety of trusted and caring messengers and make the behavior easy, fun and popular. Um, just like NHS did with their green team contest, uh, where they came up with these fantastic ideas for, for um, sustainable quality improvement methods. So um, it, it, we still remain trusted messengers. So being effective communicators, we get boggled with our terminology, just like, you know, all these papers and presentations, death by numbers, but just being um, learning how to communicate um, in a, an easy way can make us more effective. Next. Um, so some thoughts you know, as we leave um, for sustainable clinical practice, prevention and health promotion is important. If we don't have cancer, the cost is less in so many ways, including environmental cost and financial cost, educating patients and empowering them to um, in for adaptation, for education and for our, our uh, practice. Then from our um, own practices, having a lean and resilient service delivery, difficult, it's very difficult to retrofit, but we are thinking about it and headed that way. And also, even as we start thinking about using things, you know, when we go buy products, we're thinking, is this more expensive or is that cheaper, which is on better sale? Thinking the same way of the products and procedures we use. If two are comparably equivalent besides the financial cost, thinking about the sustainability and the environmental cost can also um, help us for our future. I think that's it, so I'll open it up for Q&A. So um, 
if y'all have questions uh, and uh, if we have a lot of questions, we're going to just put them all in the chat. So why don't we start there? Um, and uh, well, so far there aren't any questions. <laughs> um, Hi. Go for it. Oh. Uh, Hi, I have a question. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. And um, my question is that like my mother passed away in uh, leukemia. And that, that was a very uh, rare type of leukemia. It's a chronic monocytic leukemia. And I'm just wondering, is it something to do with the air pollution um, in impact? The leukemia? Uh, leukemias, uh, particularly uh, ALL, has uh, definitely shown some association with pollution. Um, for those living closer to, say, fracking sites and pollution sites, um, it may be an environmental factor, but not climate change related. Um, mm -hmm. But there are many diseases that we like, just like with lung cancer. You know, part of it is related to pollution, but half of it isn't. Um, there are mm -hmm. other causes that naturally occur as well. But leukemia is in one of the lists that can um, that can um, be affected by uh, environmental factors. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so. Uh... There is a question. Uh, can you explain survivor bias more? You mentioned that death count was underestimated for Hurricane Maria. Um, I just hadn't heard the term survivor bias before. Yeah, so um, that particular study um, that explained the survivor bias, um, I, I think there was Kishore all. So it's the, you know, it's a selection process. Um, so this was a door-to-door -door survey that they conducted or they sent out surveys to different um, kind of like New York has boroughs. They have areas in Puerto Rico. So they selected several regions and sent out surveys or went to the areas to survey. So you're surveying those who are still there. You're not surveying those who have moved and climate migration was significant. So the bias is that there are people you didn't survey, you didn't capture at all uh, who may be affected. Um, and that's where the authors concluded that the the bias might actually might be undercounting or underestimating the deaths. However, the confidence interval is quite wide in both of these studies. Um, so if you look at the range, you could have been as low as 800 deaths or as high as 5,000 deaths. So the confidence interval was quite wide because it was survey based, and then it was a modeling after the survey. Thank you, that was very helpful. Um, are there any last questions? Um, or any thoughts? Was this helpful? I, you know, is there is there something this, we can do to help this make re more relevant to your practice? Sorry, I, I put this in the chat. I think you maybe didn't see it, Becky. Um, this is Lisa. I uh, Lisa Doggett. Um, this was a great talk, Lakshmi. I really appreciated it, and the case discussions were super helpful. Um, I was curious about masking, and I'm like, I've kind of not been sure on really bad air quality days or if you're in an area that's really got bad um, you know smoke from a wildfire for example is it advised to use like an n95 mask is that something that we should be doing or thinking about routinely if we have you know we have sometimes really bad smoke here in austin in the summers thoughts about uh, that <laughs> Uh, somebody from pulmonary might be able to answer this a little bit more, um, but uh, the the smoke and the pollution and pollen too, um, we do see that there is an exacerbation of asthma um, from from smoke and pollution, and uh, and my take from this study from you know the wild the wildfire study was inhaling that seems to affect outcomes in some way. So at least those who are at high risk for complications from a smoke, um, 
I think it's definitely worthwhile considering. And regular masks are not adequate. It seems like it looks like the studies, you know, or whatever I saw was um, it required N95s for adequate protection. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we might be done. Um, Dr. Balasubramanian, is it um, is there any way for folks to get in touch with you or other experts if they have follow up questions in the future? Um, can't speak for others, but I do have contacts in this field, uh, so definitely happy to um, you know reach out to them and connect folks. Um, but yes, you can pass on my email. Um, okay, uh, I don't know what the best we can, way to I can do put that. it in chat, um, or if we're doing the presentation, if we're sending out the presentation, we can do that. That sounds great. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all.